welcome to LOA Today. Walt Keeson and Life Coach David Bartke here. Today is Sunday, December 17, 2017, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And we're recording the show for PRN on Thursday at 7 p.m. And David, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here for our Daily Dose of Happy. How are things in uh, new, wonderful New Jersey? <laughs> yes, it's sunny here today. It did snow uh, the other day, so... It looks really pretty. Everything's all white, and uh, it's great. It's great. That's, that's it's the, the we season, like it. right? Absolutely. It's the season, and uh, there's even an outside chance we may have a white Christmas in the Northeast, which would be really nice. We've got snow on the ground now, I so know. who knows? Now, there are a it couple days so nice where it's going to get the, melting. With but the snow uh, and the lights and It everything. does. It looks beautiful. In fact, that's what we were doing last night. Louise and I went out and checked out some of the local houses that they're over-decorated with lights because we love that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I passed the house this morning, the whole front lawn was covered with all kinds of wonderful decorations, oh, and yeah. their house was, and even their car, they had a wreath on the front of their car, oh, no and kidding. on each <laughs> side they had the little reindeer antlers. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there were a couple of those. There, there's one right near us that is just absolutely jam-packed, but, but it's, you know, a lot of these are done tastelessly. This one is done nicely. I mean, it's got a lot of stuff going on, but it's not... You know, in your face, flashing everything all over the place. You know, it's, it's nice. I like both versions. I, I like <laughs> the in your face ones that you're like, you're like, oh my god, you can't fit one more thing on that lawn. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the more classy ones too. I like them all. <laughs> well, that's all right. Nothing like nothing wrong with uh, liking them all. So, um, so we should start off with wins. How about wins for the week? Wins. Well, last night I had a really good win. Um, I went to a casino and i was actually wearing you know what a fanny pack is yeah and um my mom had actually gifted me this really nice pin she goes oh this will look nice in the fanny pack so you know so i did i put it on and halfway through the night i realized the pin had fallen off somewhere oh my in the yeah in the casino which is like <laughs> how yeah. am i gonna find that yeah they're pretty big so i re yeah so i kind of retraced the steps I thought I took from machine to machine, but then I realized I don't remember every machine I was on, and you know I don't know when it fell off. And I was like, oh my god, this is like crazy. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, well, let me go to Lost and Found, and I went over there and I described the pin to the person, and it was there. Wow, I couldn't nice. believe it. Very nice. Some nice person found it. Yeah. Who could have easily? Who could have easily kept it? You know, they could have kept it, and. Uh, Instead, they did the right thing and turned it in, and I was just so happy about that. Terrific! Yeah, that's great. So that was that was a great win. Like, and I was like so happy about that. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I would say some other wins this past week um, is that I did a really good job of keeping myself at a high vibration all week long. Very good. And yeah, and I had some great um, coaching calls with various clients, and. Oh, this is what I want to tell you too. And she said I could share this with with you on the radio. Um, a cli uh, one of my former clients emailed me. I think it was on Wednesday, and she was just like so excited because she was continuing to do her law of attraction work and use some of the processes. And one of the things she wanted to do and work on was to double the amount of money she was attracting into her life. Whoa. And yeah, she wasn't sure maybe it would come through a job or who knows how, but she was just working on that. And she now has done that. She got, a, it did happen through a job. She got a different job in the field that she's in. And she said, David, I'm so excited. And I just know this was because I was doing the law of attraction work. And she literally has doubled her salary. And it even got better because some of the time now she can work from home. Ooh. So she doesn't, yeah. So she doesn't have to go to the office setting every day, and that's another thing that she wanted. That was part of what she wanted was at least, at least some time from home. And she was just like bursting at the seams with with excitement. So I'm just so happy for her. Oh, good and for her. Even though it wasn't my personal win, I still count it as a win because you know she was a client and she was using the things she learned in coaching. So. I'm, I was just like, yay. <laughs> yeah, those are pretty spectacular wins, I have to say, too. Those are really good. Yeah, yeah. What about you? What are some wins you could report? Oh, well, my entire week was uh, getting caught up in various technical issues with the uh, 
uh, the podcast and the sound and so forth. And right. for the longest time, it was driving me nuts. I mean, literally up until Friday, it was driving me nuts. And I kept trying to get on the positive side and trying to feel good and all that kind of stuff. But uh, And I was making progress. I mean, each time that I'd find something, I'd fix it. It wouldn't quite work out the way I expected, but it was making progress. It was improving. Um, and, and what it all comes down to, by the way, that, w- without getting too technical, is that um, I, I do this on a Windows machine, but it works on this kind of similar in both Windows and Macintosh. Right. When you, when you're messing around with sound, basically we're trying to pass sound through the computer in a way that it's not supposed to do. Because not only am I broadcasting my microphone and I'm listening over headphones and so forth, and I'm hooked up to Spreaker, which is doing our broadcasting, but I've got you on a phone line and I've got another phone line plugging in. <laughs> the sound card isn't supposed to be able to handle all that. So we, there's, there's software that we use that kind of, you know, forces it to do it anyway. But that software can't take into account the fact that the way that they write Windows is designed to let Windows decide what you're trying to do with your sound at any given time, which uh-huh. can be really frustrating because if you got it set up to go one way and Windows decides it's going to go another way, that's really a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I've been learning a lot about how it works, and I finally – I've been trying various combinations because there's a number of different ways you can do the settings to line the whole thing up. And I finally found yeah. a combination yesterday that I think is actually going to solve all the problems because so far we've got a clean broadcast, no skips, um, no drops, no no drops, no skips, no errors. There's the baseball sc- score there. And the, uh, the fact that it's going so well tells me I, I think we're close to getting this done. This may actually be good like from now on, which is what I've been working for because oh, it's so hard to, to you know promote the podcast and and keep building it up and so forth when the technical issues are there. Because who wants to listen to you know people talking and half their lines are cut off and and uh, yeah, you know, that would not be good. drops. I mean, <laughs> it, just getting rid of all that stuff is is so good. So that's my big win for the week. I think I finally got all these technical issues out of the way, and it's sounding good so far. I mean, I don't know about you, but everything's sounding good at this end. Yeah, no, mine too. And what about your personal vibration? Was that did you work on keeping that at a at a high level? I kind of was trying to because I was dealing with all good. this stuff, and when you, when you're when you're dealing with difficult stuff like this is. You, you just need to do that, right? You got to keep the vibration as high as you can. And I, I can't say I was perfect, but it was always on my mind. Got to find that positive space. Got to find that sensory oh, yeah. and all that kind yeah, of thing. And it doesn't always mean you have to be the ten. Like if if you're at a, a six and you get yourself to a seven, that's great. Oh, I was know. I was happy to get to one to two sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and of course we had to talk about last week. We were talking about how food can raise your vibration. Mm. So we we had agreed that <laughs> we would think about some of the foods that we ate this past week that kind of did that for us. So can you recall a few that did that for you? Oh, yeah. Um, my wife was actually listening to last week's broadcast. And afterwards oh, she, said, okay. how could, she said, how could you forget the fried chicken? And I said, oh, you're right, because she makes the most delicious fried chicken. <laughs> she makes fried chicken so good that Colonel Sanders would probably go into a dead faint saying, I want that. <laughs> That's how good her chicken is. So wow. for me to forget that, I was like, oh, my goodness, how could I have forgotten the fried chicken? <laughs> <laughs> well, did she, but did she make it for you this past week? Yeah, oh, it was delicious, just absolutely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one. Um, let's see. There are a number of there, a number of them that I could put in there, but I'm going to name one that's seasonal because yeah. um, I like eggnog, and Ooh, I yeah. just I just bought a, a half gallon of eggnog about a week ago, and I've been going through that, and it just it goes down so <laughs> smoothly. Now I don't even put alcohol into it. I know you're supposed to put rum or whatever, and I, I oh don't I don't alcohol. either. No, I'm the same way. I don't do that, but I still love it. Oh, but the flavor of eggnog, the I mean, version, the version version, yeah. It's one of those things you either love it or you hate it. There are a lot of people who just yeah. don't like eggnog, but oh my goodness, I love eggnog. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my two. Yeah. How about you? Well, I would say for me, one was um, I was given a tin of Godiva chocolate biscuits. Oh, yeah, they were they were like kind of like the the little biscuits and different varieties and some part of them was dipped in Godiva chocolate. So I thought, well, should I try one? Because, you know, I like to to not overeat. 
and unfortunately, I tried one, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, it definitely raised my my vibration. It was so good. It was the problem was though that you know one led to two, then two led to three. <laughs> yeah, not only does it raise your vibration, it raises your raises your sugar level too. It's tough. When your blood sugar is up. Like whoa, okay, bounce off the wall time. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I try to control myself per per eating session of that. <laughs> but it didn't take long before they were all gone, but those were really good. Those were mm. definitely vibration raising. And um, I went to a, a restaurant with some friends, and the waiter recommended their turkey burger. So I'm like, well, how great could that be? But I tried it because that's what he recommended. But I have to say, on top of the burger, they put like a – orange cranberry kind of dressing on top of it along with like uh, some kind of mayo garlic mayo something and i have to say that was delicious mm. that was definitely like i was thinking to myself this is definitely one of the things i have to report <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah so yeah something about the orange cranberry sauce with that garlic mayonnaise concoction was like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear it for the garlic so, mayonnaise concoction. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, so those are the few that just in, in my immediate memory are coming to mind. But I was thinking about it during the week, and sometimes I thought to myself, no, this this one's not quite doing it. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, you were going for like the top, the top contenders. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, another thing I want to bring up, because I find it interesting, is sometimes people – ask me, like, well, what's what's the history of the law of attraction? Because, you know, like, where did it come from, or how long ago did people know about it? And so I kind of did a little bit of research. So some of the things that I found were there was, uh, and maybe you've heard of some of this, but let me know, okay. uh, a William Walker Atkinson. Have you ever heard of him? No, I don't think I know that one. He apparently used the phrase in his New Thought Movement book called Listen to this title. This is from 1906. Thought vibration or the law of attraction in the thought world. Oh, and in that book in, in 1906, he stated that like attracts like. He actually used the phrase law of attraction. So that's the earliest one I've ever heard of, 1906. Isn't it amazing though, from 1906? Yeah. And then there's also um, quotes from the from other early writings like, a gentleman named Thomas Troward, and he apparently strongly influenced the New Thought movement. And one of his quotes he is that thought precedes physical form, and the action of mind plants that nucleus which, if allowed to grow undisturbed, will eventually attract to itself all the conditions necessary for its manifestation in outward visible form. I think Boy, that's pretty amazing. That's a very precise uh, definition of it. Yes, and then there's a, a James Allen and with his wife, Lily, and they had a series of books, listen to this, from 1901 to 1912. Mm. I mean, these are very early, this is amazing, right? Right. And one of, their, one of their most famous ones is called As a Man Thinketh. Oh, yeah. And he also, he also used the term uh, law of attraction, and then there's another per, another research that says the first known usage of that term is from 1877. Really? In a book of in a book of esoteric mysteries written by Helena Blavatsky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and then of course some of the more more even though they're older, some of the more modern ones that we know about was Wallace Waddles, sure. right? Yeah, have you? I've heard of him. I don't know if you've heard of him, but well, he, he had, had a book. He had a book called "The Science of Getting Rich." He was the one whose, at, whose book that uh, um, what's her name, Rhonda Byrne's daughter, gave to her that led Rhonda to create the secret. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, so he he put new thought principles in that book and some of his personal visualizations. Um, and his his daughter Florence even quoted. She said he formed a mental picture in his head and then worked toward the realization of that vision. So that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. That and then Napoleon Hill, you probably heard of him. Oh, sure. He, yeah. he wrote in 1937, 
he wrote Think and Grow Rich. We actually did a whole program on Think and Grow Rich, like we're now doing Abraham Hicks's Asking His Grid, and back when uh, Joel Elston was my co-host. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the Buddha, the Bo- one of the Buddha's quotes is, um, "All that we are is the result of what we have thought. Mm-hmm, the right. mind is everything. What we think, we become." Right. Yep. So very that, good. I find that interesting. And then, you know, there's a lot of quotes from the Bible that are also very law of attraction. You know, you know, whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall reap. Yeah, and that's the best one. There's, yeah, there's different quotes from there as well. So I, I know, I always think it's interesting to, to trace back, at least as far as we know, you know. I think it's pretty clear that a lot of people over the millennia have at least used the law of attraction, whether consciously or subconsciously. Um, but you're right, it's interesting to find out who knew about it consciously. You were mentioning a number of books from the turn of the 20th century. And yes. that, that was actually a fairly spiritual time. There was a lot of spiritual stuff going on. Um, I mean, here in the U.S., it was still a very, very, very fundamentalist type religious environment. So it, it, mm-hmm. it was a little bit more suppressed here. But there was some. I mean, there were some, obviously, who were doing it. Um, one who comes to my mind in Great Britain at the time was the, the author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Right. He was very spiritually oriented. I don't know that he actually ever investigated what we call the law of attraction specifically, but right. he, was, he was very much into alternative spiritual investigations and so forth. So, I mean, that, that's just one person who was well known in history. That's why I mentioned him, but... Uh, there, there was a lot of interest yeah. in it in that time period. Uh, that's, I believe, also when Edgar Casey was born. I believe was around that time mm-hmm. period, and mm-hmm. he, he, of course, was. Uh, of course, he was also uh, a psychic, but his he had a lot that he contributed to spirituality at the time. So, yeah, lots of spiritual stuff going on that time. Yeah, and these are just you know some things that we know about. I'm sure there were people no one knows about that oh, were sure. also very aware of it. And- they just weren't known. Yep. <laughs> so, very, very so true. We'll never know. Well, thanks for doing the research. That was nice. Yeah, I always like to. I think it's interesting, interesting to trace it back, like a kind of as far as we can at least think we can. Absolutely, I agree. But well, isn't it amazing that even all those years back then that, that there was this awareness that like energy attracts like energy, and that what we focus on is what we attract. I mean, oh yeah, it probably. I I bet some people were afraid to tell other people because they probably thought they would be like burned at the stake or something. Well, that was <laughs> one of the know. themes that uh, Rhonda Byrne played in in The Secret, the early part of the movie and of the book. She talks about all these famous people in history who used the secret, and again, we don't really know how many of them did it consciously. She, right. she you know, she I think she, what she did is she went through like you know she found uh, Da Vinci for instance, and and she found certain things that he wrote that made her think, okay, Da Vinci was a conscious user of the law of attraction. May or may not uh-huh. have been hard to know. Uh, Victor Hugo, the novelist from France, he was another one who was uh, generally associated as being uh, somebody who, who applied the law of attraction deliberately. Uh-huh. You know, so so there's, uh-huh. there's a lot of them from history. But um, uh, I think... What about... How do you, how do you think karma p- it plays a role in law of attraction? Or do you think that's a, just a total separate thing? I, I'm not really a believer in karma, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask on that. No, I'm glad you said that because someone asked me once, well, what about karma? And I said, well, I don't think the way I understand karma, like that's a whole other, that's not connected to law of attraction. Uh, m- my only thing to say about karma whenever somebody asks me is to diffuse the situation by saying, I, I really don't care about what you believe about karma just as long as your karma doesn't run over my dogma. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> just to kind of diffuse it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then sometimes people also ask me, what about how does law of attraction, like what if I'm a religious person? And, I, and I'm just, and I always say, well, that's fine, but we're talking about something different. Yeah, I mean, it's all in the spiritual realm. Um, obviously, I think it's a good idea to try to avoid uh, you know any any uh, critique of religions because yeah. anyone who, anyone yeah. who's a true believer of their religion really doesn't want to hear that. It doesn't really help at all. And I have to admit I'm guilty of that, but I, I still try to stay away from it. Um, where, where religion is concerned, I think I can generally say that 
there, like you pointed out, there's a lot in Christianity that matches up nicely with the law of attraction. Um, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that all Christians believe in the law of attraction. It doesn't work exactly. that way. Exactly. Um, there are, as you pointed out, Buddhism has a number of parallels that work with the law of attraction, yeah. spiritual yeah. philosophy, theology, and so forth. It's not really a theology, but philosophy. Um, there's actually some parallels within Islam, although, uh, certainly it's not considered in any way, uh, consistent with Islam by Muslim practicers. But, mm-hmm. um, there are aspects of it they, that they would be okay with it. There are parts of it they would consider it to be, uh, I can't think what the word is, but basically it means that you've, uh, violated the, the, the laws of God. <laughs> I can't think what that's called. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There, there's so much in Hinduism that I'm, I'm sure there's parallels in it. I just don't know Hinduism well enough to say. <laughs> I don't either, yeah. There's either. so much but, there. And so many sub-religions and related religions over there. Um, I can say here in the U.S. there's another religion that has pretty much died out. But it was very big among the founders of the country. Many of the founders were deists. And a deist mm-hmm. is somewhat similar to a Christian, but not really. There, there are a lot of differences between deism and Christianity. But some of the more famous deists include uh, Thomas Jefferson, most likely George Washington, um, uh, Patrick Henry, Thomas Paine, uh, mm-hmm. Benjamin Franklin, uh, Ethan Allen. Uh, th- there were a number of them who, were, who either self-identified as deists or who were le- later identified by scholars as being deists. And mm-hmm. de- deism is essentially, I, I'm not sure exactly how I would describe it. It's it's a God-centric belief system, but and, it, and it, a lot of it derives from Christianity, but it also leaves a lot of Christian teaching behind. So it, it's kind of like, it, it's like what the Pope calls your um, cafeteria-type Christian, <laughs> Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. Take, take the part you want and leave the rest, which uh, the Pope doesn't like too much. But yeah. But the point is that, uh, I mean, Jefferson, for instance, Jefferson is known for having the Jefferson Bible, right? That's something that most people have heard of is the Jefferson Bible. Mm-hmm. What most people do not realize is what the Jefferson Bible actually is. The Jefferson, is the Jefferson Bible is not the Bible. The Jefferson Bible is pieces of the Bible, specifically an English version of the Bible, a French version, a Greek version, and a Latin version. And he basically went out and cut out pieces, mainly the story of Jesus. And, and pasted them into what we would call a scrapbook, side by side, because he wanted to read each of these scriptures side by side in the, the four, those four languages to compare and contrast them. And if he had been, if it had been known by the leading churches of the day in Virginia that he was doing that, he probably would have been considered a heretic. That was the word I was looking for right. before. Right, right. He, he would have been considered a heretic, which at that time was punishable by death, by hanging. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, th- yeah, that's what the Jefferson Bible is. The Jefferson Bible is Jefferson's take on the story of Jesus as drawn from four different language versions of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's interesting, the whole history. I mean, there's probably other quotes from different people way back when, and it's just uh, amazing. Like, it's, obviously, it's law of attraction has always been. It's always oh, been sure. in existence. Yeah. I like the fact that Abraham uh, was able to connect through Esther Hicks and share all the wisdom they've been able to share. They being Abraham. Abraham's not one uh, spirit, one person. It's a, it's a collective or a community of spirits or, or spirits in the source energy stream or however you want to say it, but it's not one being. And yes. I, I'm glad that they were able to, to make that connection through Esther because the amount we have learned about how all that works has been tremendous, and it, now oh if, you, my God. if you're one who doesn't believe it, who thinks you know, who's critical of it, and and who doubts the whole thing, well, sorry, you're missing out on some good stuff. But <laughs> yeah. but for me, I think yeah. it's I think it's it's the only spiritual teaching I've ever run into that I wholeheartedly believed. Um, yeah. I've heard pieces of others that I could identify with, but you know, especially with the major world religions, I so often. I felt myself at odds to what they were teaching. 
And mm-hmm. this is the mm-hmm. one. This is the only one I've ever, ever run into where I said yes, 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 yes. I agreed with all of it. It felt every single thing that was was said to me. A lot of it was new, but it all felt right. It all felt true inside. Yes. Now, what what does this um, Abraham quote mean to you? So the quote is everything you think about and focus on, you're saying yes to. Yes. What does it mean to me? Um, yeah. Well, it was it was a thought that took me a while to come to terms with in my earlier days of exploring LOA, like roughly seven or eight years ago, trying to understand the nature of why it is that our requests don't always seem to arrive. Mm-hmm. And early on, I, I heard that one, and it confused me a bit. I didn't quite get it. In fact, as I've explored it over the years, I realized there are a number of different ways that it's explained that actually confuse more than they clarify. <laughs> it wasn't until I got a hold of the Abraham Hicks teaching about the, the two-ended stick, one end yeah. being thing and the other end being lack of thing. And when I yeah. contrasted the thing with lack of thing, then it finally started to make sense consistently to me. But uh, the, the fact that any thought that we think is a request helps to... It, it, it helps to understand that when you think about it in terms of thing and lack of thing, because everything that we're thinking about is either about things or it's about denial of things or it's about rejection <laughs> of things or it's about, about wanting things. You know, it, it, it's always in that general realm, but each of those things can be divided into one of the two, either thinking about the thing or thinking about the lack of thing. And I've often wondered about the whole Christian concept about why is it that all prayers are, aren't answered, and, and the Christian, typical Christian answer is, well, they're all answered, but sometimes the answer is no. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, mm-hmm. well, that doesn't really ring right. That doesn't really ring true, because I, I don't buy into many aspects of the, the Christian mythos about what God's nature is and so forth. I, I, I just personally find it to be inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I, I just couldn't buy into this whole idea that if you pray, sometimes the answer is no, sometimes the answer is yes, because that's a rather capricious God saying, well, I'm going to decide when, when I'm going to give you something and when I'm not going to give you something and all that. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't buy into that. But I think, but I think that's pretty, pretty daunting though to really think like, wow, whatever I'm thinking about or focusing on, I'm saying yes to. Right. Like I'm, that's why it's like, wow, I better be very careful what I'm thinking about. Well, that's why I now adopt the idea that the answer to every prayer is yes. So when we're when there's a, a prayer that we put out and we don't seem to be getting it, it's because we contradicted our own prayer. We put out, put out one wish and then we put out a wish that counters it. And the wish is usually in the form of a thought that we were kind of unguarded about. So uh, the classic example would be is, I want a million dollars. Oh, I'll never get a million dollars. <laughs> right? Yeah. You got the one wish, you yeah. got the other wish, but we don't really think of the second one as a wish. Well, it is. It's a thought. We put it out there. It's got vibration. That's right. That's right. Or I want a million dollars. Well, how's that going to happen? Yeah, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> the minute you go into how's that going to happen. Yeah, you're dead. There, you're, it, go- yeah. there it goes. Dead in the water. You're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How about you? What's What, what does it mean to you? Because you're the one who asked the question. Well, that's what I think it means. That's why I think it's daunting that literally it means anything we're thinking about, we're saying yes. We're saying yes to everything we're thinking about and focusing on. So when we're focusing on what we don't want, we're saying yes to that. Yes, that's what I bring that into my existence. And the same is true of the opposite. You know, when we deliberately focus on what we want, we're saying yes to that. And that's what I'm saying. It's so important to become very aware of what we're thinking about and how we're thinking about it since we know that we're saying yes to everything. Yeah, it's especially if, important if what if we we're want. thinking about isn't what we want, we better take action to, ch- to change it, tell yourself a different story about whatever it is. Right, yeah, because, well, it's only important if we want to influence what it is we're attracting into our lives. If we're not buying into the law yeah. of attraction and we're willing to live by default, well, then it doesn't matter much. <laughs> but if you want to have well, a deliberate yeah. application, then, yeah, it matters a great deal. Yes, I'm, I'm assuming that people listening are are more the ones that are into the law of attraction, resonate with it. So that's why, like, it's always a good reminder. Like, we're saying yes to everything we think about. We do, yeah. 
And and when you look at it that way and you realize how many times we put out we're, – we're very complex people. We, th- we put out very complex thought structures and st- thought structures that often work against the ones that we were thinking about a minute ago. And when you try to line all that up and, and kind of track for yourself, okay, what was I what was I focusing on? What was I attracting? And, and you try to divide up into little categories. Well, this was attracting this kind of thing. This was attracting that kind of thing. This was – with this was countering that thing while that was countering that. I mean, it, it turns into this muddle trying to figure the whole thing out, which is why <laughs> I, I'm so glad to have the emotional set point thing. Otherwise, we'd be a, we'd be a mess. <laughs> yes, and, and the saying yes to everything also goes back to because um, we've talked about before about focusing on what is or what we want. Like sometimes maybe someone's business isn't doing good, and I'm like, well, what do you want? Well. I wanted to bring in a lot more money, but it's just not doing good. <laughs> I like, but if you think, if you realize you're saying yes to everything you're thinking about, then you're you're spending way too much time thinking about how your business is not doing good. All right, it's better to spend time uh, saying. So, what what would your business look like if it was doing good? Right, but that's what I'm saying. That it's it's easy to get caught up in the what is and oh my god, this isn't working out. How's this going to happen? Oh yeah, but once. But once we kind of really get, once you really get more and more and more that we're we're saying yes to everything we're thinking about, Mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit easier to shift. Even even if it, even if what is, if what you want isn't what's happening yet, because that's where it gets tricky because we want to see it. Well, it's interesting you should mention that because our show this week is about uh, chapter 18 of Ask and It Is Given. I mean, obviously, we, yeah. you and I have been doing that book since the beginning. And By the way, there's only 22 chapters, so we're nearing the end. Oh, my goodness. Okay. But chapter 18 <laughs> is entitled, You Can Gradually Change Your Vibrational Frequency, which is exactly what you were just talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. So let's hear it. What does it say? All right. It says, just because you make the decision to find a different thought, it does not necessarily mean that you can go directly to that thought right now, for the law of attraction has something to say about the thoughts you have access to from where you are. Of course, there is no thought that you cannot eventually have, just as there is no place that you cannot eventually reach from wherever you are. But you cannot instantly jump to a thought that has a vibrational frequency very different from the thought you are usually thinking. Sometimes one of your friends who is currently in a much better feeling place than you are may encourage you to stop thinking so negatively and choose more positive thoughts. I do that to myself all the time. But just because your friend is there in that better feeling place does not mean that your friend can bring you there. For the law of attraction will not allow you to find a vibrational frequency that is far from the frequency that you usually sustain. And even though you do want to feel better, you may not feel that you can find the joyful thought that your friend wants you to find. But... We want you to understand that you can eventually find that thought and that once you have deliberately and gradually changed your vibrational frequency, you will be able to sustain that more positive position once you do achieve it. As you discover that you can always know the vibrational content of your being and can therefore always be aware of what your your point of attraction is, you, you will then be in conscious creative control of your own experience. And once you understand that your emotions are giving you specific feedback about your vibrational content, then you can proceed with the deliberate and gradual adjustment of your vibration. They are kind of a wordy bunch, you know that? <laughs> but they finally, they, they, it takes them a while, but they finally get there. So here they are. Reach for the best feeling thought you have access to. Choosing a different thought will always produce a different emotional response. So you could say, I will deliberately choose my thoughts so that I can feel better. And that would be a good decision for you to make. An even better decision and really an easier one to make is, I want to feel good, so I will try to feel good by choosing a thought that does feel good. They're always better when they say it more directly. When they say it more directly, it comes through better. (laughs) If it is your decision to follow your bliss and you have been focusing on a life situation that is nowhere near your bliss, your decision to follow your bliss would be unsuccessful because the law of attraction cannot deliver a thought that holds such a dramatic vibrational difference. But... If your decision is to reach for the best feeling thought that you have access to, that decision can be easily achieved. The key to moving up the vibrational emotional scale is to be consciously aware of, even sensitive to, the way you feel. For if you are not aware of how you feel, you cannot understand which way you are moving on the scale. You could be turned around and on your way back to Phoenix and not know it. But if you take the time to consciously determine the emotion that you are currently experiencing, 
then any improvement in your feeling means that you are making progress toward your goal, while any intensifying of the negative emotion means that you are going in the wrong direction. So, a good way to feel your way up this vibrational emotional scale is to always be reaching for the feeling of relief that comes when you release a more resistant thought and replace it with a more allowing thought. The stream of well-being is always flowing through you, and the more you allow it, the better you feel. The more you resist it, the worse you feel. And that, David, is the entire chapter. Wow, but it's an important chapter. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah, it's, and I think it is really important to restate that we can't get from a low vibration to a super high vibration, and that's okay. Just like they were saying in that in that chapter, even one thought better than where you currently are will be extremely helpful because then from that thought then you can get one thought better from there and so on and, and gradually raise yourself I just realized it's, it's analogous to climbing stairs if you're at the bottom of the stairs and you want to be in the top of the stairs y you'd be crazy to try to do it in one step <laughs> yes you'll never be able to pull it off but you can pull it off one step at a time that's right. I like I like that image. So, if you're looking at the top of the stair, and whatever, however you're feeling that is very low, one step up equals one thought a little better than where you are right now, and then another step up is a little bit better than that thought, and then eventually you will get to that higher vibration with a better thought and a better thought and a better thought. There's also another analogy that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but. If you fall down the stairs, it's a lot like falling in a depression because it's a mm -hmm. long fall and it hurts when you hit the hit the bottom. Yes, very similar. Yes. So the, it, and what's interesting and what's interesting too with um, you know a lot of the people I work with, sometimes you don't feel like you can reach for a better thought. Sometimes people don't like they're so they're so down or low for whatever reason. But you know what I've learned? It's always there. It is always there. Yeah. I mean, you I don't can, know how you... You can reach for one thought better. I don't know how you do it yourself in most cases. I know in my case, the first thought that always come to my, comes to my mind whenever I'm trying to reach for something a little bit better and I can't find it is, where's the silver lining? There's always one mm -hmm. somewhere. I just have to find it. Every single situation, no matter how bad it is, has a silver lining. And it can sometimes be a little bit tricky trying to get ourselves to latch on to it because there's so much attraction to that negative stuff that's going on. Yeah. But it yeah. is there. And you look for it. And if you look for it and find it, then you do the best you can to latch on to it. That's how you get up to yeah. the next step. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that is so – I know that from my own experience and people I work with that – there always is the one better thought. There is. And then maybe in that moment, you're not ready to go for the one above that, but eventually you will be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It takes practice. It takes time. I know when I first started, I really didn't believe it was possible to move my emotional set point on my own deliberately, consciously. I thought that mm -hmm. my emotional set point was always going to be governed by events, by what is, by things that happen to me. Circumstances, yeah. Circumstances, yeah. right. So... The idea of moving my emotional set point seemed impossible. And I can tell you, the first time that I did it consciously, I was amazed. I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe it. I actually, I actually <laughs> made myself happier and nothing happened to make that happen except for me. Right. Right. Yes. It's a very yes. empowering feeling to get. Yeah. Cause if you think about it, when, when, when you're not having a quote good day and you see other people that are, it's like, well, they're having a good day. What's what's the difference? It's and it's the difference because of what they're thinking about and focusing on. And the really, really sad and slash funny part at the same time is that when you're feeling depressed, seeing somebody who's having a good day makes you even more depressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could happen, I suppose. It does happen. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Because because there's a certain envy that goes on. Um, once again, though, it shows it isn't so much. Whether somebody else is happy that matters. What really matters is what are you feeling? What are you feeling at yeah, this time? Yeah, I was going to say yes. I was going to say because um, there's there's no competition. There right. really isn't. And and it's it's much better to say, oh, that's that's so wonderful that they're doing so well. Like everyone's in their own kind of vibrational world. So celebrate those that are doing great, 
And if you need to, then start raising yourself as well. That's one of those Abraham Hicks concepts that takes a while to kind of latch out to and buy into. But it's really yeah. true. The idea that you know we we all live in vibrational worlds, like you said, our own little vibrational worlds, but we live on the same physical plane. We're in the same place together. So it's yeah. different, but the same. And that can also be a little bit confusing because mm-hmm. how can it be that you can have two people living and working in the same space and one has everything going for them and the other one doesn't? Well, that's how. That's precisely yeah. how. The fact that one has a different vibrational thing going on than the other person does. And they're both in the same physical space, relatively speaking. But nevertheless, they've got two entirely different experiences going on. Yeah, and a really good uh, habit to get into is if there's someone that you're envying for some reason, or maybe there's something you're trying, some goal you're trying to reach, and someone else has reached it, and you're like, oh, man, like, go to the... I celebrate for that person energy and vibration because not only will that help you keep your vibration high, you're going to open yourself up to also achieve that. Whereas if you go into the opposite of like, oh, man, how come they got that? Or how come they achieved that and I didn't? What am I doing wrong? All that kind of talk is just going to keep you down there. But if you could always – I always tell people, like, you know, who's – who do you know that has what you want? And they tell me, and I say, well, celebrate for them then. Celebrate for them that they have that. You know, raise your vibration about that, and you're helping yourself achieve that as well. Instead of being, you know, why not me, why not me, why not me? Right, yeah. If you can get yourself into that celebratory place where you're feeling good for them, that's only going to help you. Um, exactly. Now, if it's on the other side yeah. and, you're, and you're finding that you can't, that you're finding that all you're feeling is the envy and the jealousy, well, then first thing to do is just take your attention off of them. you got to stop paying attention because <laughs> they're just going to drive you nuts. You know, if you, can, if you, find, you can't find that positive thing about them to feel good about, then find a positive thing somewhere else. The last thing you want to do is keep focusing on that negative feeling that, that you have about their success. That's, that's the most important part. Yeah. Whichever way you get yeah, off, it's fine, but, you know. Yeah, and, and the you know the universe is so big that there's plenty of success for everyone. It's not it's not because they have success you can't. It's yeah, like, that's good news, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, from a law of attraction point of view, if you could start celebrating people that have achieved whatever that maybe you want to achieve, because then you're opening yourself up to receive that instead of blocking it. Right. Right. That that concept of blocking too is an important one. Because early on, I didn't really understand how I was blocking myself. I, I was really very unaware of my own tendency to contradict my own thoughts. I, I, I just wasn't paying much attention to it. And yet even when I, I began to learn that, yes, I was capable of doing that, I still didn't fully grasp how it is that I'm – where's the blocking going on? And more precisely, they talked about resistance. Where's the resistance? I'm not resisting anything. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm resisting anything. <laughs> what, you know, shouldn't I feel something inside if I'm resisting something? Well, actually, you do. You just haven't really been paying a lot of attention to it. That's what I found. Um, when, when I'm not feeling, when, when I'm feeling resistant, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling really, really yeah. good inside. Yeah. Which is a lot of the time, unfortunately. I'm still working on it. But uh, the point is that when, when, you, when you're not feeling good, that's your clue. When you're not feeling, yeah. and, and by good, I don't mean content. I don't mean like okay. I mean, good. I mean, like, yeah, I feel good right now. When you're not feeling yeah. that, that's when you're resisting. And well, that, I like, that takes a while I like to... I think of resistance as, like, there's, like, this invisible wall in front of you, and everything you want is coming towards you. But resistance is blocking it. So, like, mm-hmm. all the fear, worry, doubt, how is something going to happen, when is it going to happen, that's all resistance. Yep. And once you can start, once you can start shifting your thoughts away from resistance, and you're knocking down that wall, that invisible wall, and then you're allowing what you want in. Yeah, it's almost like a, a an enterprise force field, right? The USS Enterprise from Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, yes, force field on, or whatever they say. <laughs> <laughs> so we're saying force field off. Yes, because we off want to field. attract and let in everything we want. We're on, we're not afraid of those phasers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Although in, that, in their concern, put the force still down. Yeah, right. the <laughs> there are certain energies you do not want to attract in. 
<laughs> One of those yeah. is Phaser Fire. <laughs> <laughs> but from a law of attraction point of view, we want to <laughs> knock down that invisible wall of resistance so we can allow in what we want. <laughs> the other thing that you don't want is those, uh, what do they call them, proton torpedoes or something like that? I forget what they call them, something like that. Yeah, there, there was actually a very interesting uh, Star Trek episode. It was one of the older ones. Like, you know, from the, what was it made originally in the 60s? Or, yeah, yeah mid 60s, sure. early to mid 60s when it, when it was first, when the first, um, what do they call it? The, uh, the, the first episode has a name. I can't think what it's called. Yeah, but whatever. It was from, it was from the original episodes and they ran into a alien race and anytime you were near the alien race, whatever you thought is what manifested. Mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, it's so a lot of attraction. So, yeah. They were with, and be, before they realized that, all they were like getting into all these fights with them, and all these right. negative things were happening because the people on the Enterprise were like in fear, and they kept thinking, "Oh, I have to protect myself and save myself from this." So that's what they manifested, mm -hmm. and then they started realizing that once they thought good thoughts and happier thoughts, then that's what would happen. And I just thought. Hmm, I bet whoever wrote this episode was very into the law of attraction at the time. Gene Roddenberry wrote it. And uh, the word I was looking for was the pilot episode. That was the first one. There were actually two, oh. like what you were talking about. The, the first episode did have the manifestation part in that there was a race that was studying the humans from the, from the Starship Enterprise, and particularly their captain, Captain Pike. And they, right. were, they basically <laughs> would get into his mind and, and it, it would try to set up uh, like hologram type situations that, where he felt like he was actually living in that situation and uh, eventually he figured out that was going on and, and fought and resisted and pushed away but later on, much later on a number of episodes later, he comes back because he got injured and and was basically confined to a wheelchair and decided he wanted to go back to uh, where that planet was because he knew that at that planet he could feel like he was still alive even though his body wasn't actually moving. He, he was still able to be a fully active being. So that, oh, that's, that, that's, that's what that I'm story not sure is if about. That's the, maybe that is the same one I'm thinking about. Well, there's well, a second one. All I know one. is I thought it was so interesting that when they... When they thought the bad thoughts or something negative, that's what manifested yeah, like there was in a, the moment. There was a second one that and came they, on about two years later, and it was an episode where they end up on a planet. It's a recreation planet. And on this recreation yeah. planet, every thought that you have immediately manifests into, into that something. Must be the one, that must yeah. be the one I'm thinking of. Right. Yeah, that was, <laughs> well, you know your Star Trek episodes. My oh, goodness. my God. I watched so much. It's crazy. I mean, I was an addict to Star Trek. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I went through all the series. I went through the original Star Trek, Star Trek: The Next Generation, Star Trek: Voyager. Okay, I mean, so, yeah, oh, so then you know the episode I'm talking about. The, yeah. the only thing I did not do is dress up as Spock and go to the convention. But other than that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have. That would have been vibration. Oh right? God, you no, you please. <laughs> you would have had fun. <laughs> there, there's a difference between attracting and obsessing. I mean, I do not want to be an obsessor. <laughs> But yeah, that's the episode, and it's it's totally a law of attraction. It is. What you think about is what's going to happen, and, and even though in the episode it happened immediately, it's still the same idea. Yes, yeah. It was interesting that they were portraying that, too, and they got away with portraying it on TV, and they got yes. good ratings for it. That was really interesting. <laughs> long before Abraham Hicks comes along and talks about law of attraction, long before Rhonda Burton comes along and publishes The Secret, Star Trek was talking about law of attraction. Yeah, so I'm sure... <laughs> I mean, Gene Roddenberry must have been into it, I'm sure. He was very much into alternative thinking, alternative ways of, of understanding the universe and addressing uh, political issues and, and popular issues and so forth. And I, I think that's where a lot of it came from. But I wouldn't be surprised if, at least on a subconscious level, he was drawing heavily from his own other being, his, his non-physical side of his being, in order to yes. put, that, put that episode together. Yeah. I also saw an old interview with Lucille Ball, and she was also, she made a few comments in that interview, and I thought to myself, she's also very into law of attraction, because mm. she was telling the interview, well, you know, you have to be careful about what you think about, because, you know, what you think about is what you're going to bring to you, and I thought, hmm, and yeah. even some of the I Love Lucy episodes, there are a few episodes that kind of reflect that, where, you know, her character would tell you know, Lucy would tell Ethel, like, oh, Ethel, you have to hold a positive thought so we can make this happen. Oh, so, right, yes. I, 
I also think she probably was also into it based on putting, putting together some of these interviews I've seen her in and then some of the things in the shows that they talked about. I mean, certainly given how high her level of success was, I mean, she was an extremely successful woman in life. Um, oh, not, yeah. not just with her, her programs, but just in general, she was incredibly successful. She and Desi Arnaz both were. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all that they were certainly applying the law of attraction to their own benefit and most likely, like you say, actually did it consciously. They knew something about what it was they were doing. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And she wasn't, she wasn't that young either when all her huge success happened. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, the advent of television came along and like so many people who had been in, uh, you know, the theater world and so forth, she made the leap and, and she made it very successfully, incredibly successfully. To, to this day, this is the part that's amazing to me. That is the one television series from the 1950s to this day that continues to play everywhere around the world. Isn't that amazing? That's just stunning. <laughs> and there's still, and you could watch them and they're still, every time make you laugh, every time yeah. they're funny. They're, 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 they're slapstick, but they're fun slapstick. It's very good. They just made it so believable, and they were just so good, and, and the, the writing was so good. It was just, ugh. I'm trying to think what my favorite one is. I think my favorite one is where she's on the chocolate assembly line, and she that can't keep up, so she's, classic, she's trying yeah. to eat the chocolate in order to keep the assembly line going. <laughs> <laughs> that is hysterical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's so many. I don't even know if I have a favorite one because there's so many. I don't know. There was a, I don't know if you saw this one, but it was also very funny where uh, Ricky's mother comes to visit and she doesn't know English. So Lucy, Lucy hires uh, someone to translate for her so she can talk to her. So she she's wearing an earpiece in her ear that no one apparently knows about. <laughs> and this, this professor's in the kitchen. So every time her, uh, Ricky's mother says something in Spanish, he translates for Lucy what she's saying and tells her how to respond. Oh, okay. It's really funny. And, and, and then, of course, something happens where he can't do it anymore, and then she's, like, stuck trying to figure out what to do. It's right. so funny. <laughs> so she's trying to extempor extemporaneously create the uh, conversation in a language that she doesn't know at all. Yeah. <laughs> right, because he he's in the kitchen, he, and she's wearing a uh, thing in her ear so he can, she can hear him. And he, he said, oh, she just said, how are you doing? So tell her, you know, and he tells her in Spanish, like, what to say. And then he has to leave because his daughter had a baby. So Ethel's like, Lucy, he had to leave. I don't know what to tell you to do. So then she has to, like, you know, just kind of fib her way out of knowing what she's doing. It was just so funny. So and, funny. And <laughs> she, she was the outstanding clown. She was the ultimate clown. She was so good at it. Yes, yes. So that kind of ties in with the history we were talking about in the beginning, that, you, you know, even... It does. It does show up in these 1950s TV shows. I was just realizing that there, there are a number of gurus who have uh, played major roles over the years that we should give mention to a, a nod to. One being Tony Robbins, who was really big in the 1980s and early 1990s. And while I don't think he actually taught it as the law of attraction, it was a part of what he was teaching. Um, mm -hmm. I can't honestly say that. What Robbins taught worked for me much of the time because he was teaching kind of an aggressive um, go after it kind of thing, which wasn't always totally in alignment with law of attraction. But nevertheless, right. he was pushing the positivity button a lot, and he, yeah. so he deserves a lot of credit, I think. Yeah, I also I'm not sure I don't know everything he uh, teaches, but he's a phenomenon. My God, he's just oh yeah, he just has that way about him where. He just inspires so many people, and he gets them to walk across those coals, those hot <laughs> coals. Yeah, he's the one who pretty much popularized that. But um, he put out a series of uh, tapes. Of course, this was back in the era of the cassette tape, right, long before digital. And yeah. uh, I got the package called the Unlimited Power Package. And it was a series of, I think it was like 24 cassette tapes, which were basically him lecturing on various aspects of his topic. Um and I, yeah, I he, just, he just has that gift where he he can do that. Oh yeah, <laughs> he knows. Yeah, yeah. And I listened to the entire he series. Or whatever. I I can't say that he he won me over, but certainly there must have been some influence there because when I got exposed to the secret and law of attraction through Abraham Hicks, I was ready for it. I was ripe for it, and I think he played a yes. role in, in making me ready for that. Yes, 
Yes, but even like I said earlier, when I used to live in California, I used to go to a New Thought church, and the oh, really? preacher, the preacher there, he was also, you know, he wasn't famous, but he was preaching law of attraction and knew a lot about it and got us all high vibration raised and you know it's just uh, wonderful that it goes on too even with people that aren't quote you know well known but they're still in the in the communities they're still talking about it and trying to help people with it so this wasn't somebody whose name I would recognize no no but he had his own little not non-denominational church in North Hollywood and probably about 50 of us would go and he was great and he was all into the law of attraction and new thought and all his sermons were all about you know how your thoughts affect what you're attracting and all that kind of thing and I, it was great back then and it just makes me think wow hopefully there's a lot of other you know things like that going on all over the country all over the world as well so was that where you first got your introduction personally? Um, no, I was actually fortunate enough where someone told me about Michael Beckwith. Oh, that's and right. This, yeah, this was way before, you know, The Secret, before he was all famous. Um, and I, would, I started going to his church, and his sermons were, like, amazing. Talk about... Raising your vibe. When you were done listening to his sermon, you were at like a 10 vibration. Like he, was just, he was just that good. And then I started taking some classes with him because at the time he was offering classes and that kind of started getting me into it. And then uh, I found out about this other guy and I started going to his lectures. But um, it's just wonderful that that exists, you know. Well, yeah, you were very fortunate to have one of the original teachers from The Secret as your person introducing you. That's phenomenal. I know. I I agree. <laughs> I agree. I was just uh, I was fortunate in California that the few quote guru type people that I was led to were legitimate. You know, they were like the real deal. Sure. And because I've heard about some other people, and they did not have such good stories to tell, and. They kind of were like, you know, more cultish than than learning type thing. And I thought, yeah. thank God, I didn't know about any of that. That's sad when that happens. And unfortunately, there are a number of people who do that. But um, you're right. You're lucky you got the good ones. That That's really quite terrific. Yeah. And I would definitely recommend it because I think you could hear a lot of his lectures on YouTube, I'm sure. And I would definitely recommend checking some of those out because he's pretty amazing. When was it that you first got exposed to Beckwith? Um, it must have been, let's see, I moved to L.A. in 84, so I would think somewhere in the, okay. you know, 86, maybe just a few years after I moved there, I started So mid-80s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so you've you've had exposure for quite some time. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, always, law of attraction always resonated with me. Like, it always felt to me like, yes, that totally made full sense to me even if i didn't fully understand it it just i just felt it like yes that makes sense yeah i can see why too i i kind of wish i'd had that direct um connection i i did get connected to w clement stone around that same time period but he wasn't really on the same law of attraction thing he was more into the successful attitude stuff which was okay but just not quite the same thing would have been great to have helpful at like the that. time uh yes and no i'd actually i, I, <laughs> I think it actually so. helped me back in some ways because the way that, they, that the success people teach it is often not accessible, I find. And I, I oh, probably, I I'm, we're running out of time on this episode, so I, I, I really can't get into it in too much deal this time, but we could bring it up, you know, next time. But essentially, a lot of what they were telling me, I couldn't apply it in a way that would work, so it, it, it almost boomeranged. But that's another topic. Uh. Hey, we're about to, uh, we're about to finish up here. Before we leave everybody, I want to remind you, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast, please do so at LOAToday.net, or you can do it on your iPhone at the iTunes store or in your podcast software, either one, by searching on LOA Today. And if you have an Android phone, you can do it there as well, just by going to the Google Play Store. And David, if someone wants your coaching, ho your coaching help, how do they do that? They can just go to lifecoachdavid.com. And they can contact me from there. And, of course, I always offer a first free mini phone coaching session for anyone who's considering coaching. Terrific. David, it's been a pleasure as usual. 
Yes, it has. It's been great. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great week.